Academy. Uh, I don't have, unfortunately, any financial competency in this book. Uh, we're going to talk about scheming and analytical quick overview. We're going to talk about new exciting things over the past year, year and a half. One American every 40 seconds has a stroke. 780,000 cases of acute ischemic stroke every year, so it's an important pathology. It's the third leading cause of death in the U.S., and it's the leading cause of disabling, long-term disability in the U.S. Acute ischemic stroke is the most common subtype. Keep in mind that there are mimickers of stroke, like hypoglycemia, very important, complicated migraines and seizures. The diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis. We, fo we do a focus history, trying to look for key points, like for example, that's not normal, which will uh, guide us in therapeutic options in, to manage this patient. And also we do a focus history, uh, clinical examination, uh, doing the NIX stroke scale, and looking for stigmas of liver disease, coagulopathy, arrhythmia, endocarditis. The NIX stroke scale is an excellent tool. It has excellent inter-examiner reliability and sensitivity. The caveat is that it was designed for anterior circulation strokes, and that way they were able to grade and, and, uh, and assess uh, that type of stroke, but not so much for posterior circulation strokes. The, we aid ourselves also with CT scans, and they should be done within 20 minutes, and that's in the guidelines, looking for bleeds. We have here an example of a epidural hematoma, subdural, subarachnoid, IVH, or intraventricular hemorrhage, and uh, left temporal IPH. We also calculate what we call the ASPECT score. This score was developed in Canada. They divided the MCA territory in 10 segments. We subtract a point for every area of hypodensity within any of those sections, and if the patient has an ASPECT score of less of, of 10, means that the whole territory uh, we don't have any signs in the whole territory of any uh, early infort, and if we have an, a score of zero, that means that the whole territory is infarted. The reason I bring this scale up is because this is one of the inclusion criteria on many of the new ischemic stroke trials, especially those using endovascular intervention. And it's also important to know because when we give IVTPA to patients, if you have an aspect score of less than seven, the likelihood, likelihood of you having symptomatic ICH is 14 times higher than if, you're, if your ASPA score is more than seven. We also look at this, try to look for this sign in non-contrasted CT scans, which we call the hyperdense sign. In the, we basically look at the M1 segment of the middle cerebral artery. I like to look also at the vascular artery. It's an early indicator of thrombus formation, of large burden of clot. That is caused, or this artifact is caused because as the cells clot, the plasma extrudes out of the cell, and the debris that is left behind causes this increase in the density of the hematocrit in that area. That is a sign of, again, large vessel occlusion, a lot of clot. Some people hypothesize that IVTPA doesn't work when you have a lot of clot, but that shouldn't deter you from using it. We also do CT angiograms to look for any large vessel occlusions. Because if you have a large vessel occlusion, it's probably because you have a lot of clot in that vessel, and we need to think about intervention like thrombectomy. We also aid, our, aid ourselves with perfusion scans. And what we look for is cerebral hemodynamic failure. We look for penumbra, and we look for M4. Penumbra is, what we mean by that is ischemic brain, salvageable brain. We use three parameters, cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood volume, and mean transit time. Penumbra means that your cerebral blood volume is preserved, is normal, due to complete or maximal dilatation of your arterioles if you have good collaterals. To maintain a normal cerebral blood flow or, or a low normal cerebral blood flow with an increased mean transit time. What mean transit time means is what, how long the blood takes to go through the territory that is being uh, affected. Infarct or, or core is when you have a very low cerebral blood volume with an increased mean transit time. I just want to say as a caveat that you shouldn't take the mean transit time parameter by isolation. It should be an adjunct to try to determine areas at risk. What I mean by large vessel occlusion, this is your circle of Willis, it's the large vessels of your circle of Willis, your vascular artery, the first segment of the middle cerebral artery, your, the first segment of your anterior cerebral artery, your supraclinoid ICA. 
and the first segment of your posterior, or your PCAs, posterior cerebral arteries. What I mean by defi deficits in perfusion, in this case, for example, uh, you have a preserved cerebral blood volume with an increased main transit time, that's penumbra. When you have a decreased cerebral blood volume with increased main transit time, that's core. Interestingly, when you have decreased cerebral blood volume, or that signal sig uh, kind of predicts pretty well how big your stroke is going to be, as you can see here in the diffusion weighted image in our MRI when we do it a few, a few days later. The 2018 guidelines, AHA, ASA guidelines for early management of acute ischemic stroke come to update the 2013 guidelines. And what basically they've done is include these two exciting concepts of early window intervention, endovascular intervention, and extended window of endovascular intervention based on six trials that came out in between 2015 and 2016, and two trials that came out in the last six months that pretty much extended the window of intervention up to 24 hours and the vascular intervention. IVTPA, good old IVTPA, is safe, is effective, please use it. Multiple randomized control trials have shown that it's, it works and it's safe and extensive use in multiple communities around the globe prove that. Please do not follow or disregard all the conspiracy theories about TPA in the internet. That it doesn't work, it works. The NEANS trial was the first trial that compared IVTPA with placebo. 30% of patients that receive IVTPA back then had minimal or no disability. Only 6.4% had a complication of symptomatic ICH. Didn't have any difference in mortality. We gotten better by using uh, by using IVTPA, and now we, for example, in this registry, we have a risk of ICH of 1.6, and 56% of the patients have favorable, favorable outcomes. The ICAS 1 and 2 trial and Atlantis A and B confirm what we know about IVTPA given within three hours, but they also gave TPA up to six hours. Between the three and four and a half hour window, they define a subgroup of patients that benefited. And that's how the ECAS-3 trial came, which extended the, win the, the, the window of IVTPA to 4.5 hours. As long as you have patients less than 80 years of age, you're not in any anticoagulation, you don't have any history of diabetes and stroke, and your NIH scale is less than 25. Obviously, the longer you wait to give TPA, the less you're gonna benefit from it, and the more likely that you're gonna have complications that you can see in this pool analysis, the odds ratio. As times go by, the odds ratio go down, so 4.5 is the ceiling, all right? How about giving, instead of 0.9 mix per cake, which is the actual dose for IVTPA, by the way, you should give 10% as a bolus of the total dose in the first minute, and then the, t the rest, the remaining over, over an hour. How about if you give 0.6? Shouldn't we reap the benefit and spare us the side effects? The Enchanted trial, which was a non-inferiority trial, look at this, and the answer to that is not. It's not as effective as 0.9 to reap the benefits of mortality and decrease severe disability at 90 days. Between 2015 and 2016, like I mentioned, six trials came out, and they told us that doing IVTPA and going ahead and doing thrombectomy if the patient has a large vessel occlusion is a good thing. You should do it. 64% of the patient had excellent outcomes if you do it. So who do we do it? Up to that point, within, between, around 2015 and 2016, patients that had NIH stroke scales more than six, an ASPET score, like we discussed earlier, more than six, meaning there, there's not a lot of territory involved with ischemia and doing that on those patients actually, as we mentioned, improve outcomes and you have to use an extend retriever. Because that was a critique uh, on the prior studies, three studies that showed that they didn't have any benefit initially. The devices that we were using were different. The Hermes trial, which is here, confirmed that. Doing, uh, doing thrombectomy with IVTPA is good, up to six hours. But then they saw some point estimates. That if you use perfusion scans and you select your patients by brain imaging, you can actually benefit those patients beyond eight hours. 
That's how the Dawn trial and the Diffuse 3 trial came to light. And, those are, and that's actually the recommendation now. It's a class one, two-way recommendation that you should evaluate and try to do thrombectomy up to 24 hours with selection of your patients using perfusion scans, new, te new technology, right? So I'm gonna talk about, first of all, the Dawn trial real quick, because Grady was the primary site. Uh, they did thrombectomy up patients up to 24 hours. They use a pretty sophisticated or elegant way to select patients based on clinical radiographic mismatch, meaning they saw the patient, the patient looked like, looked really bad compared to the aspect score in the CT scan and also perfusion. 49% of those patients have minimal or no disability based on modified ranking scale. The denominator to treat was two. The trial was stopped early because of the good results. There was no difference in mortality or symptomatic ICH reported. The diffuse three trial looked at patients between six to 16 hours. They did thrombectomy using perfusion volumetric uh, selection. They look at the volume of infarct and the ratio of ischemia and infarct and the, again, excellent functional outcomes, 45%, and they also saw, or they did see mortality benefits at 90 days. In a nutshell, what I'm trying to say is that you shouldn't lock your patients in a time window anymore. Time is brain. That's true, we all know that. But also collaterals is brain. Penumbric brain is also important, and we should try to detect them and intervene if we, if we can. Um, if you're gonna do uh, TPA, please use aspirin within after 24 hours of TPA deliverance. If you're gonna do TPA, bring the blood pressure below 185 over 110 and keep it below 180 over 105 after you give them. If you do endovascular procedures or thrombectomies based on the Dawn trial, we like to keep systolic blood pressure less than 140 to prevent preperfusion injury. A lot of back and forward about what to do when you have a cryptogenic stroke, meaning we don't know why they had a stroke and a patient has a PFO looking at you. There's been a lot, again, back and forward about this. Three trials over the past year and a half. The close, reduce, and respect trial. Essentially, what they say is, or their results is based on this new device they have. You can close the PFO, especially if you have a large defect. And compared to aspirin and anticoagulation, the rate of recurrent stroke is less. Uh, but you have to pay a price the risk of AFib is 4.6%, as high as 4.6% in the intervention group. And uh, there's also a lot of uh, procedural complications. So as of now, the 2014 recommendations is not to do anything with PFOs. We have these three new trials that disagree. Uh, the jury is still out. The only real recommendation based on the guidelines is that if you have someone with a PFO, and DVT, and you know that the patient will have recurrent DVTs, you probably should uh, consider closing it, the, the defect. Um, the caveat is that these recommendations were based on, on a trial that used a different type of device, so you're still out. Hemorrhagic stroke, hypertension is the most important and prevalent risk factor because it causes a vasculopathy called lipoyalinosis and the formation of charcot bouchard and microaneurysms in perforating arteries in the brain that cause the pattern of hypertensive bleeds that we see, especially in the basal ganglia. Cere cerebral amyloid angiopathy is an important risk factor in the elderly demented population because you have deposits of beta amyloid in the medium and small vessels and uh, also in the meninges and brain. So there's a close correlation of lower hemorrhage and, and, and bleeds and Alzheimer's dementia. It's, it's a pretty interesting pathology. To me, it's kind of fascinating that low cholesterol is described as a low risk, as a, as a risk factor of ICH. And this is essentially a thought that came from animal studies. Cholesterol levels below 200, around 170, 150, are associated per those studies with necrosis of the smooth muscle of the tunica media of the arteries and that create aneurysms that 
cause bleed. There was a thought that statins could do that based on the SPARKLE trial that uses statins and for patients with acute ischemic strokes. That has been debunked. We know that statins decrease thrombogenesis and platelet, platelet aggregation, but it does not cause any, any, or it's not associated with symptomatic ICH or ICH, so you should use it. Please admit those patients with hemorrhagic strokes to the ICU, ideally neuro ICU. If you have signs of herniation, place an ICP monitor and then keep the, the zero perfusion pressure within an acceptable range. If you have a patient taking warfarin based on the INCH trial, you should use four factor PCC. Compared to FFP, it decreases your INR rapidly and it, it, it prevents uh, expansion of your hematoma. A lot of back and forward as well about what's the blood pressure goal. The Interact 1 and 2 and Attach 1 and 2 trials try to answer that question. Uh, bringing or being intense or aggressive and bringing the systolic to 140 or less is safe based on those four trials. Less hematoma expansion, but the uh, likelihood of death is, and severe disability is not decreased. There's no difference. The INTERACT-2 trial look at a subgroup of patients with mild ICH, which they define as GCS less than 14 with a volume of bleed more than 10 cc's. Say that those patients should probably be aggressive. And the attached to trial look at what they call improvement of mental and physical quality of life based on a, on a scale they came up with, the EQSD scale. And they said that patients that you are aggressive actually improve your, your outcomes. Uh, so as of now, the recommendation is to bring the systolic blood pressure less to 140 or less than 140. Obviously, your brain is attached to a body. so. Make sure that your other organs are perfused and you should adjust your goals regard, uh, depending on that. Please do DVT prophylaxis with heparin and heparinoids within 48 hours of a, of a bleed. We don't like to use antiepileptics as primary prevention for seizures. If you seize, obviously give it to them if they seize. Uh, except in patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage and subdural hemorrhages that there's data to use antiepileptics for seven days. If someone is on aspirin and bleed, don't give them platelets. The patch trial shows that that's not good, it's bad, increases mortality. Hematoma expansion is one of our dreaded complications early on because it pretends a poor prognosis. We like to do CTAs in people that come into the ICU with ICH, not only to try to figure out the etiology and if they have any vascular malformations, but also to look for this sign, which is the spot sign, which is acute um, extravasation of contracts within the, within the hematoma, and it's an excellent predictor of hematoma expansion early on. So some people argue, why don't we use hemostatic agents to try to prevent hematoma expansion if you have that predictive uh, sign? So they stop it on the spotlight try to answer that question, they use activated recombinant, recombinant factor seven, no benefit, so we don't, we, don't, we don't do that. We've been trying pretty hard to, to try to make noble seven work in different studies and it, it never gives us benefits. If someone is taking Davigatron, please use Idarizuzumab. In the trial, 32.6% 30, of the bleeds were ICH, excellent decrement in your diluted thrombin times and anchoring times. And with that, I think I'm done.